multiprocessor HPC rack, you know, with many sockets and many cores. So we're looking at you know, one CPU with one core, with four cores, you know, eight cores, four <coughs> CPUs with 32 cores each, and maybe 10,000 CPUs with 12 cores per CPU but, you know, on a HPC rack. And then, of course, we're looking at GPUs. Um, GPUs might have 65,000 cores per GPU, and some people then put racks with multiple GPUs in. So uh, that's quite a wide range, and we get C++ running on all of these systems. So if we've got multiple threads running on our system, then we're, we've got communication between those threads, and the potential issues for communicating between those threads vary quite considerably across the range. Now, if you've got things running on a one-core single CPU, then the communication between threads doesn't need to go anywhere, it's just there. Now, within the, probably within the cache on the same CPU, it might have to go out, but it's only got one memory bus. On the other hand, if you've got 10,000 processors with multiple cores, then it's probably actually meters of wire between your different processors. And so the communica communication is going to be quite different. And your code is scalable if you can design it so that it runs nicely across a wide range of these, of these systems. And so that as you get more cores and more CPUs because your, your customers upgrade their systems, or if you're shipping libraries, then people incorporate your code into systems across the applications that run across a wide variety of systems, then your code in, you know, scales the performance with the system and you don't end up with big bottlenecks. So, yeah, why do we want to do that? It's because our customers are getting better, like better systems as time goes on. Desktops are getting more cores, phones are getting more cores. No? Servers are getting more CPUs and more cores. No? Fundamentally, our customers, as developers, our customers' machines are getting more cores and more processors. So we need to think about designing our code, you know, improving <coughs> the design so that it scales as our target machines scale. You don't want to have to redesign your machine just because the customers have upgraded their computers. So, the limitations of our system. Now, many years ago, David Butenhoff coined a nice term, mutex, for um, mutual exclusion, and fundamentally it is a means of preventing concurrency. Now, so, so yes, it was Dijkstra who invented the, the, um, the acronym, but it was David Butenhoff who was the designer of POSIX threads, who says, maybe it would be better if instead we called it a bottleneck. <laughs> because you know, it is the fundamental um, uh, the <coughs> reason for a mutex is to prevent concurrency, prevent multi-threading. And so if we have too many, then that just kills our scalability. So yeah, we need to avoid mutexes, but not completely. The, the thing that really kills the performance with a mutex is not the existence of the mutex, but it's when you actually have the multiple threads trying to lock it, the contention on the mutex. So if you have mutex that, is, that in practice is used by one thread at a time and the design of your system means that it's got low contention <coughs> but the mutex is there to provide correctness, then that's okay. It's when you have a, you know, if you take the extreme case, Python has a single global interpreter lock, which means multi-threading on Python just does not scale, because you know, <coughs> they, every time they, you need to do something, it needs to take the lock and the whole system has to wait. And so you end, essentially you end up with you know, a, a <coughs> single threaded system. <coughs> And obviously, the Python, the Python developers who are working on the language are working to avoid that and improve the cases, but it's an, that's an example of the worst case scenario with the use of mutexes. And so, if you're designing a C program, we're not restricted to having one global mutex, and you want to avoid doing anything that amounts to that. 
But it's not just mutexes that suffer from this problem. You say, fine, we'll ditch all the mutexes, we'll use atomic operations. Atomic operations can also suffer from the contention problem, particularly <coughs> if you have read, modify, write operations. <coughs> Because if they are operating on a single location, then they need to be serialized by all the CPUs that access that location. And trying to serialize access to a single memory location across 10,000 CPUs is going to take a while. And, it's, and though that is an obvious case, you get the same effect though smaller in scale, with the smaller multi-core systems. So the problem doesn't just go away because it's all on a single socket, it's just far more obvious when you have multiple sockets. So we need to be sparing with our read, modify, write operations just as we need to be sparing with our mutexes. But the other thing is that it's not just single memory locations that are a problem. CPUs share data by the cache line. So if you have data that is used on multiple, multiple memory locations that are on the same cache line that is also used by your multiple CPUs, then you have essentially the same problem. But it's not immediately apparent from looking at your code. Now, cache lines are typically 16 to 128 bytes. Um, I think some systems actually go up even 512 bytes. Now, our colleague from Intel can probably tell us what the range of their currently shipping um, processes are. But the, the idea is that uh, you have more than one data <coughs> item that is next to each other in memory and conceptually is a separate thing, but you still get the synchronization overhead of trying to coordinate the cache across multiple CPUs. And so from, from the purposes of you know, scalability and contention, then these multiple objects might as well be a single object. And this, whole, this, this idea is called false sharing because they are sharing the cache line even though they are not really the same object. So that's something to be aware of. See, the explicit problem that you get with, with the sharing is, is cache ping pong. The cache line is pinging back and forth between the CPUs. So CPU A is accessing some mer a memory location and it therefore is trying to do a write, it needs control of the cache line. A second CPU also wants to write to that cache line, a different memory location perhaps, but on the same cache line. So the cache line has to be transferred to the second CPU. The first CPU then tries to access the memory again and it has to be transferred back again. And so it goes ping, pong, ping, pong, back and forth between the CPUs. This takes time and can have a big impact on performance because transferring cache lines is slow. And just to think about how slow, you know, the speed of light is 310 to the 8 meters per second. And CPU clocks are of the order of a few gigahertz. So I'm going to say three gigahertz because it makes the maths nice. The speed of light, therefore, is around 10 centimeters per clock tick. So that doesn't get you very far. Uh, so th that puts a hard upper limit on how fast you can transfer data, how far you can transfer data in a clock. This is therefore particularly apparent for multi-socket systems, because it implies that hard upper limit on communication speed. Pick an Intel processor that might be used in a server, the uh, Xeon 5 7295. It claims 115.2 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth and 1.5 gigahertz clock speed with 72 cores. It sounds all you know, really good specs, but if you actually do the maths, that means it can transfer 76.8 bytes per clock, which is not a lot, particularly if you then divide that by the core, so that's one byte per core per clock. That's, uh, <laughs> as I can tell you, that's, you're going to end up being memory bound in your, in your processing. 
<coughs> yeah, so, uh, you, that is a... <laughs> so th this can in, can be a very real limit. Obviously, you know, it's, if the memory is on the set, is managing to be in cache, then the communication will be less. You might actually get more throughput than that in practice. But it gives you a, an idea. Of the, very, of the fact that there is, there is hard limits about the amount of memory of data you can transfer between cores. So, what can we do about this when designing our system for scalability? One possible option is batch communications. We try and avoid intermediate synchronization. So each thread works on its own copy of the data and only modifies shared data at the end. <coughs> so, if in this idea, then your each thread is, is, is now spending a large amount of its time being a single-threaded process. So, you don't have to worry about using mutexes or atomic operations or any synchronization overhead, and you're not trying to worry about transferring data between processes because the single thread on a single processor processing a big chunk of data. Then, when it's done with that data, then you look at you know, a, some form of communication protocol, that, and that is where you then have to focus the you know, cross-thread synchronization issues at the synchronization points. And so, that is one possible way of reducing the ongoing synchronization, because when, it, when your, your threads are running on their independent batches, then you don't need to worry about shuffling the data around. You're not worrying about, fault, uh, about cache ping pong unless you've got bad <coughs> false sharing. And so the, you know, the overall performance of your application can be better. So let's look at some C++ code to have an example. We going to start with we we've, we've got you know, a vector of values. We have some function get values that's going to produce our produce our vector. Um, and then we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to do some form of you know, count of of data from 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 these values. Those accumulate some some count, which we're going to have. Uh, an atomic unsigned long long, it's got a lot of data, so we need a big number, then that's going to store the count. So we have some number of threads, and uh, we have a vector to hold, hold, hold the thread handles. Um, and so we create, a, create all our threads. They, we have our you know, start and end of regions for the batch of elements that each thread is going to process. And then for each thing in that, each data element in that in that section, then we're going to add that onto our count. Now this is a no a, an atomic variable and which is shared across all our threads, and they're all going to modify the count for every single data element in their batch. As you might expect, this is not a good plan. <laughs> we have big communication costs. Each of our independent threads is doing a series of operations, but the updates to the count have to be serialized. So we have these big weights. Thread one adds its bit to the total, and then it passes it on to thread two, which updates its little bit for that one element, which passes it on to the next thread. And in the meantime, the first couple of threads are now waiting for their turn again. And this is all managed by the processor and the cache mechanism. You have no control. So these weights are just stalls. You know, nothing is <coughs> happening. And so, you know, it, it's not a nice um, regimented one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. You know, the the um, processor and the cache coherency mechanism will just pick an order. So you know, if you see them in the middle, then we, you know, we shuffle about a bit, do a bit of dancing around. Um, and you don't know what that order is going to be. But either way, it's just a big load of waiting. 
So you know, this is the worst case scenario for contention you know, on your atomic operating value. So how about we change it around? Instead of having our for each and updating the count every single element, we do our batch. You know, we use accumulate to gather up the sum totals of e for each each thread gathers the sum total for its elements and then we add that on at the end. So now when we look at what happens then we each each thread can do its operations together. You know, it can do a batch of operations to its local count, the local totals, add them all up and then we get the serialization of the final adds to the global total. We've eliminated all those intermediate weight steps apart from at the bottom. So how about an alternative way of doing it? Instead of using an atomic value to accumulate the totals, instead we use futures to accumulate the individual totals. So we have a vector of futures that corresponds to the you know, one future per, per thread for each of the threads that we've got in our system. And we launch an, an async task on its own thread that's going to calculate the sum total. So we use accumulate to do the local totals on each of the tasks again. But this time, rather than adding them directly <coughs> to the global atomic, we return store it in the futures, and then at the end of the week, <coughs> we wait for all the futures and add up the values. So in this case, we've now got each of the threads and it returns its local total, and so they're not, they're not waiting for each other. What we have is one thread at the end that's waiting for all of them. And so that's changed the dynamic. It's moved which thread is doing the waiting which potentially means that the cores that were doing those tasks can now do something else. So, I ran a run with 100 million elements on four threads on a four core machine. I think it was this laptop, but it might have been my other one. Um, running it all on one thread gave us whopping 0.81 seconds. If I changed it to all atomic operations with that first one, it was a mega improvement of 120 times slower. <laughs> and 9.74 seconds. So really, really don't do that. By using the atomics at the end and the futures, actually it came out at exactly the same time. When I averaged over the runs, it was 0.52 seconds, which is 1.6 times faster. Now, it is faster, but actually that's not a very good improvement. We've got four threads and it was only a 1.6 times improvement. So, no. Overall, yes, it was worth it, but it does show that just putting things out on threads doesn't necessarily get you the uniform scalability that you might like. And there is overhead to creating and managing threads. And that's the synchronization and the serialize and transferring the data between threads incurs a cost. Even no, and even on quite big workloads, you know, we've got 100 million elements there, you know, so that's still tw that's 25 million per thread, that's, that's not nothing. Um, it still doesn't get us the uh, big level of improvement that we might have liked. We have to you know, look at all the options and always profile and check that you are <coughs> getting the improvement that you hope for on your target platform. Because it's all very well running on my laptop, but if my laptop isn't my target platform, then the behaviour might well be different. Okay, so what about other things? Suppose we have a linked list, and it's accessed by multiple threads. You know, we, we want to maybe add or remove elements. What can we do? No, because you know, that is the sort of operations you might tend to do to a linked list. So what can we do to protect it? Well, there's various options. We could use a mutex for the whole list. We could try and use a, a mutex that covers each link in the list, so that that allows different threads to, have, um, to be accessing different elements at the same time, and it's only when they're actually trying to access or modify the same element that you need to that they, they need to worry about about the contention. 
you could use an atomic of a shared pointer of our nodes for the node links, which automatically allows you know, multiple threads to access it and ensure that it's done in a, in a thread safe fashion so you don't end up with nodes being deleted whilst your uh, while somebody whilst one thread's accessing and the other other thread removes them. Uh, you don't have to worry about whether the updates to the links are atomic because they always are. Now, so that's one potential thing. Or you could use a plain atomic with a raw pointer for the node links and then yourself do some form of safe memory reclamation scheme to ensure that if you remove nodes then you're not going to cause somebody to be trying to access the node you've just deleted. And so that because the it is usually the access to deleted nodes that is a big problem with some form of shared dynamic memory um, shared data structure. If the whole if the data structure is constant and never changing, then everybody can can look at it without any form of um, a synchronization, and all the processes can take their own copy into their own caches, and you're not looking at the continuous synchronization and data transfer. So it's only for you know, updated data structures, some mutable data structures that you need to particularly worry about the um, about the synchronization costs. See, if you use a whole list mutex, then this is your big bottleneck. You know? If any of the threads are trying to access this, they have to block the mutex. Only, therefore, only one thread in your whole system can access your shared data structure, and that's undesirable. If you have a per node mutex, then you have a lot of little bottlenecks. You've got a lot of mutexes. Typically, it actually means that probably the mutex on the head node is actually going to act as essentially a big bottleneck because the, every operation has to start there. And so it does mean there's going to be a lot of serialization and potentially a big performance impact. The atomics don't help a lot, to be fair, because the, particularly with atomics of shared pointer, if you use atomic of a shared pointer, then you're going to end up doing a lot of reference count adjustments. And what's a reference count adjustment? Well, a read, modify, write operation. And if all the threads are doing reference count operations on the same set of reference counts, you back with essentially a whole load of little bottlenecks. Now you, you've got the, you know, the, each thread ends up being serialized in the way that it accesses each element. And in fact, um, atomic of shared pointer might even be implemented with a mutex on the <coughs> common implementations it probably is. So it doesn't really gain you anything at all. Another option that I mentioned was to use atomic of raw pointers with some form of safe memory reclamation scheme. This is typically good if mostly your data structure is read-only. If the biggest, if the, the nodes don't change very often, then the node links can now be copied into all the in the, all the processor caches, and the readers usually have a typical a fairly low cost. The cost then gets all transferred into the writer, which then, you know, if any any threads that are making modifications now incur some form of you know, a big cost, and the actual cost depends on quite on the implementation strategy that you might use. Various options. Obviously, one is use garbage collection. Um, there are garbage collection libraries for C++. Uh, some people swear by them. Lots of people swear at them. Um, <laughs> so it, not everybody uses them, but it is there as an option. Um, a second option is to use a scheme called RCU. This is commonly used in the Linux kernel, and there are also user space um, implementations as well that run on Windows and Linux and I think I saw one from Mac OS as well, so they're fairly widespread. Um, and it's short for read, copy, update, and the, the idea is that the readers are really, really low cost, and that the update on the writer side is again, is again where all the cost is incurred. And, it's, and the writer, essentially, they wait for the current batch of readers to finish before they can then do their modifications. Hazard pointers is another alternative scheme. 
and in this case it's again it's designed around the idea that, that the readers are relatively cheap and the writer and the, making the modifications is expensive. On the read side you update a local variable called a hazard pointer which says the, my thread is currently referencing this element and any other thread that tries to update a um, no, and remove an element has to first check are any of the threads in the system do any of them have hazard pointers <coughs> to this object and see if you've got a lot of threads that means a lot of checking you know, if, you, if you've got you know, a thousand threads that means that the writer has to check a thousand variables to see whether it's safe to delete an object and so that, that does incur a big cost on the on the on the deleter side um, but it means that the reader side, it just has to store a, a, local, a thread local variable, it's, you know, so there's not a big cost. It, again, moves it all to the side of those doing the update, updates. So as a more concrete example with the RCU, the readers just record the entry and exit, and I don't know, if you're in a kernel space, then that might actually be no ops on the readers, because the kernel knows far more about the scheduling than anything else in the system, and it can know where all the threads are, but in user space you probably do actually have to record I'm starting an operation, I'm finishing an operation, but again it's a local thread local update. But, so the writers, they, they make their changes, but they can't delete the nodes until they've waited for what's called a grace period, <coughs> and this grace period you know, allows for all the readers that, were, that could possibly have accessed the node to have finished, and then you can delete the removed objects. So you know, this is what it looks like in terms of running through, through time. We have the time starts at the top and runs to the bottom. We have a couple of readers here in, in green. They are potentially accessing the node we're about to delete. On the writer side, we try and we remove our node in the red section. We remove it from the data structure. So at this point, when we hit the dotted line, then no new accesses to the data structure can possibly see our deleted node. But we haven't actually deleted it yet, we've just removed it from the data structure. And so then, we have to wait for this grace period until the green readers are finished before we can actually delete it. We don't care about the blue readers, they're after the dotted line, they can't possibly see our, our, um, our node that we're trying to remove. So it doesn't matter how long they take. So that's the idea from RCU, but obviously that imposes that grace period cost on the writer. A question? Yes. How do I know how long the grace period needs to be to ensure that no reader is still accessing the option? In advance, you don't know. Um, in this is why the reader nodes need to store their entry and exit to the read zone, because the writer can then check, are any of the reader nodes still alive? They typically, okay. um, you typically have some form of generation count so that you know the, how, uh, at what point did the reader start its, 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 um, its processing. So it, it's not just sleeping for a fixed amount of time, it's really continuously checking, are there still readers alive? That yes, well, it, it might be continuously checking, or it might be um, putting itself to sleep with an OS weight of some description so that it gets woken up when yeah. the last reader um, goes <coughs> out, yeah. is out of the zone. So what does this actually cost? On the read side, we have an atomic read of the global market to say what generation are we, and then two atomic writes to a thread local <coughs> operation. These are thread local things apart from the global read, so they're not particularly expensive. And it's a, and it's a read, not a write to the global object, so again, that's, that can be shared across uh, cache lines. It doesn't cause too much of a performance impact, though if you have many CPUs, there will be a propagation cost every time um, the writer makes an update. On the right side, we make an update to this global marker, and then we have potentially multiple reads of all the um, reader statuses, and possibly some mutex locks and delays and spin loops and OS notification. This is potentially expensive on the right side. If you're in kernel space, there's no overhead on the read side, and on the right side, there are nice functions you can say, wait until all the CPUs have cycled a clock, uh, cycle, cycled a thread, uh, a thread cycle, and then we know that we're safe. You know? And so it really is a lot less um, synchronization overhead if you're in kernel space. 
And for those of you who are writing on embedded platforms or real-time OS things, then you probably live essentially in kernel space. And so you might well be able to take advantage of that. But for people on desktops and normal you know, Linux or Windows-based servers, then you're probably not in kernel space. Okay, so what the hazard pointers <coughs> cost us? Well, the readers store the hazard pointers and to refer to their objects, and the writers then make the atomic changes and they check the hazard pointers. So on the read side, we have two or more atomic writes to our per thread hazard pointer and a spin loop to ensure that you have to check no, okay, well, I was, I'm trying to get a hazard pointer to the object referred to from, no, from, from my first, from a given pointer, <coughs> and I'm going to check what the, what the value is and make sure that I've got a consistent value that I'm then going to use to dereference to get to the next, next element. So you might have to spin a couple of times in case somebody else is modifying it in the meantime. On the right side, then, you have an atomic read modified write option to add to your reclamation list, and potentially, because the overhead of checking is so large, you don't necessarily reclaim your object immediately. You, instead, you have periodic reclamation checks. When I have some number n of not yet reclaimed objects, then I start checking. And the cost then is you only have to check, you've got to check all the hazard pointers across all the threads, but you can check them immediately against all the to-be-reclaimed to be objects. So you check each has a pointer. Uh, um, you can gather them all together and check them once, rather than repeatedly checking every time you do a, do a um, modify. And this cost then is a periodic cost that depends on configuration things, but it does depend on you know, the number of threads in the system and the number of times you're doing a write and how how or long you're willing to have your not yet reclaimed objects live around. So the cost of a retiring object can actually vary by orders of magnitude depending on the configuration parameters. So we've got some standard support but um, potentially in the pipeline for you know, these safe reclamation schemes. There's proposals for RCU and hazard pointers um, with freely available implementations that um, whether whether they in, whether these freely available implementations are usable on your particular platform is uh, obviously in my very because uh, they are relying on particular properties of the platform they're in, they're targeting. <coughs> so another aspect that you might consider is the idea of sequential consistency versus eventual consistency. Now the term eventual consistency has gained a lot of um, traction with the idea of um, no, no SQL style databases where no, we don't have to have things always up to date all the time. <coughs> no, you can, uh, this is in contrast to no, sequential consistency where no, everything in the system agrees on what the current state of affairs is and so you have a single total order of operations and you need to make sure that it's you know, continuously synchronized. Whereas the eventual, um, no, eventual consistency is saying, well, as long as it all works out in the end, then that's okay. You know, so as long as we keep a track of, of who's made all the different modifications, you know, then, and we get there in the end. So this is like our, our batched up counts. You know, we don't need, if we don't need that running total, then we can save, save updating the global count until later. Now, as long as as long as we keep track of what all the operations are, we can avoid that extensive communication that's required for <coughs> synchronization. So eventual consistency requires much less communication, but you cannot write a single order, order of operations. You cannot say this operation clearly happened before the other one because they really didn't, and the different threads might might disagree based on the propagation times between when the data gets updated on a local. On a, on, on a given CPU to when it's updated and made visible to the other CPUs in the system. So sequentially consistency is easier to reason out, eventual consistency is far more scalable. So if you can design your system around the idea of eventual consistency, then that will help you some scale from the small systems to the really large systems.
So in summary, your multi-threaded code really needs to be scalable if you're looking at developing not for the systems that, run, that you're running today, but for the systems your customers are, becoming, are going to be running next year and the year after that. In order to do that, you need to avoid contention on atomics, which do read modified writes, and on mutexes. Because fundamentally, you're trying to avoid cache ping pong. And so that means not avoiding the contention and avoiding false sharing. If, you're, if you've got data structures that are visible to, every, to the world, you need to make sure that you are using some form of safe memory reclamation scheme rather than um, mutexes and, and live and atomic updates um, with <coughs> share pointers to the individual parts because then that allows you actually uh, in some sense then your ha hazard pointers and RCU are, are essentially a, a, a type of eventual consistency. We're removing the objects from the thing but we're saving the deletion till later. We're not worrying about whether it happens right now as long as the deletion happens eventually. So that provide, allows you to provide the scalability. Obviously, one point that it isn't on the slide is that if you can avoid the communication altogether by splitting your code into lots of single-threaded parts, then that is the best state. Okay? The best scalable system is something that doesn't need the communication. But, I don't know, that's, a, that's something that you know, um, parallel algorithms people call that em embarrassingly parallel. Um, there's nothing to be embarrassed about. If your system works out like that, it's brilliant. You know? um, but for most of us, that is not the case. And it requires either luck or careful design to manage to make that the case. So in most cases, you're trying to look at how do we make our, the communication we do have, how do we make it scalable. Okay, so quick plug here for my book, the second edition is going to be printed any day now. <laughs> Honest, only for the last year they've been saying that. Um, <laughs> it does cover the new updates for C++17 and concurrent DTS. You can buy a PDF copy, uh, which you know, does contain all the words. It's, you know, it's a complete copy, and, but it's PDF only at the moment. There will be print copies at some point. So, any questions? Where to start? So first of all, um, what about such an idea that uh, you kind of go, go with the sequential uh, concurrency, but you agree up front that uh, who will do what when, and uh, then you schedule those bits and pieces, so you know that will be that many reads and that one write, and then that many writes, and that many reads. And agreeing up front in compile time. And generating uh, the different scheduling schemes based on uh, the availability of the data, which, so you, you have an input data, and based on the input data you can say, it will be executed in, in this order, and having all the possibilities, and generating the fixed schedule for it and in runtime only only based on the input just switching between them would it work would it scale <laughs> will it be able to compile it well so it sounds to me very much like your your compiled pro okay so yes so the, the question is if you've got a um, if you can pre-compute your series of operations, you're going to say thread one is going to read all these data, then it's going to write to this other set of data, and in the meantime, thread two is going to read this first, this second set of data, and, and you have to <coughs> pre-compute what your series of, of operations is going to be. So, if you can do that and make it work, then that that has the potential for being great. But the first thing is to say. That in order to pre-compute it, you need to know how many target threads you've got on your target platform. So you're compiling for a specific number of threads. And um, if you're 
hoping to ship some software this year and it will just magically scale when your customers upgrade their system next year, that's not going to work. Um, but if you know what your target is, because you're writing, you're building for an embedded device, that then um, you're writing the software, you're putting, shipping the hardware too, and when you upgrade the hardware, you can recompile it, then that might, there, there is scope for that working. The second thing is, computing that series of operations is going to be hard work. Um, if the operation is running, uh, potentially do, uh, the system is doing running lots of times, then the, the hard work might well happen, but you know, it depends on it's going, you know, that's going to be how much time it's going to take you to calculate that, I wouldn't like to guess, and it might be that you, know, you, you can do it in a reasonable length of time and it might be that you can't. But you know, if, if by all means you're happy to try if you've got the time to do so. <laughs> Yes, back. So you mentioned the cost of uh, creating threads. Does that actually depend on the threading model that you use? So if you compare, for example, a thread thread, uh, open a thread? Uh, yes, every, every different thread. It will probably mostly depend, in fact, on the operating system. Um, you know, the cost of starting a thread on you know, desktop <coughs> Linux is going to be different to the cost of starting a thread on you know, Windows Server. And possibly even to Linux when it's in, in its server configuration because the expectations of what the kernel is doing is going to be different, and so the costs are going to be different. Uh, so, but yes, there, there is overhead, and it, and it does vary. Any more questions? Yes. Speaking from a special bias, uh, as you uh, closed off, the, the normal problems are not that HPC kind of Here's an array or a list, and let's just um, colonize it. But it's more heterogeneous, you know, different objects communicating. And uh, so my bias is uh, the actor model. And um, so, do you think that the answer to being future proof is exactly uh, that uh, optimization or, or approach that you share almost nothing, or if you share, you share as safely as possible? And then you do message passing as the CPU is doing already. There is a paper called uh, "Your CPU is a distributed system anyway uh, already." So uh, it seems that if you if you do message passing and at a special granularity, as you said with batching, then you might be future proof. But the scheduling is the problem that uh, the person tried to to offer a solution for by free computing the scheduler. But, uh, I guess that is not really pre-computable. Yeah. Maybe, uh, what, what do you think of the, uh, maybe not just C++, but rather, rather the other implementations of the Yeah, so, so, so the question is obviously, that, um, does, does using the actor model provide some form of solution to this? Because in the actor model, then each actor is working on its own independent data, and then you've got the message passing to communicate. And <coughs> yes, potentially in some aspects it does, because you're, your threads are, you know, to a large extent, independent, but you do have these communication points, you know, the, the message queues between the between your actors, and so it depends on whether or not there is big communicate. If if lots of actors are communicating to to, to one target actor, then that's not going to be good. Um, whereas if, if two actors are really talking, you no, know, they're talking a lot. Um, there's those two over there and those two over there. And, uh, and another two over there, and there were you know, lots of small conversations. Then there's a whole, there's a lot less contention, and that potentially can be can be a solution to the problem. But it it is about how you design your actor system. Um, the modeling and, and, and how and where, where yes, how how you model it and where you put the boundaries. But um, it can be really effective. Um, obviously, the probably the most wide the known use of the act, of the actor model is in Erlang, where you know, they, the whole point of the system is to have many millions of actors that communicate between themselves, and they do it very fast and it works very well. But you still have to design your system right. Yeah. So it's not a it's not a panacea. You have to, it's all about how you design the communication parts and avoiding that contention. In this case, it's contention on a given actor rather than contention on the mutex. So. <laughs> Any more questions?
Yes. So I have a question regarding the other pointers. Uh, you mentioned that the readers, they will use two times to make sure that the value hasn't changed. And this sounds to me like a fight arm trial, like uh, what does it mean? And uh, okay. what if we read, read this uh, too few or too many times? Okay, so the, the question is about hazard pointers, and I said they might read a few times to make sure that the pointer hasn't changed. It's not an arbitrary count, a few times. It's the, the the point is they have they they read the value and, set, and store it in their hazard pointer. They then read the value again to make sure it's still the same value they just stored in their hazard pointer. Uh -huh. And if it has changed, then they repeat the process until they've got the, the matching value in the hazard pointer oh, okay. and in the, the point you're reading. Okay. So it's not an arbitrary just a few. Oh, three, four. But how do I much do I feel like today? <laughs> it's you know a there a, there's a process of why it's like that and making sure and it's about making sure there's consistency so that you've got your hazard pointer is pointing to the right thing so as long as one one read match the the read value then the process stops and then yes. one. Yeah. yes that's right as soon as, as soon as the, the hazard pointer that you stored matches the read when you check it then you can stop okay, okay there was a question at the back yeah um, Ask you or has a pointer, the writer's thread has to check for all the reader threads. And what if one of the reader threads takes an extraordinarily long time to uh, go haywire or some calculation and takes more time than all the other threads and the whole process kind of grinds to uh, yes, avoid, the, how do you avoid this? Okay, so the question is with RCU and, ha and has a pointers that are checking for the, against the readers, what if they take a, the readers take a long time? And what if they've got a particularly problematic reader that's taking ever such a long time for some particular reason? And that can cause a problem. But typically, one would work around this by, um, by relying on the eventual consistency, the deferred reclamation. So I, I specifically mentioned it with hazard pointers, but you can do it with RCU too, which is to say, I've, I've got this object that I, that I want to delete as soon as the, the readers are done. <coughs> now I'm going, oh, I can't delete it right now because somebody's still, still reading, so I'll put it on the list and do it later. And then eventually you come round and the RCU um, and hazard pointers both have mechanisms for you know, checking for um, pending deletes and making sure that eventually they do happen. Um, possibly by having a dedicated background thread that just does that. You know, but uh, there are other, <coughs> other means as well. But yes, it, it can be a problem. The, it, it, essentially, it just means that the delete won't ha it gets deferred an arbitrarily long amount of time, so you need to not rely on the delete happening immediately, um, and, you know, but, and be, be happy with your nodes still being allocated, but not part of the data structure. Okay, I think there was a question over that side. Was Actually, there was a very same question. I wanted to ask about the RCU and will the writer get start? What's the mitigation situation? But I guess it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. So. so, do we have any more questions? Yes. Um, so, uh, I, I was wondering, since you said that uh, the, the, the atomics basically have to synchronize the same way that the mutex has, just on the hardware level. So, wh where does that leave us with uh, regards to um, lock-free data structures? Like, are they just like they scale a little bit better than, than the locking ones? But once the, the the number of threads the number of threads grows even further, they're also not usable. Or like, is is there still a use case for them? Or what what is your take here? Okay, so um, the question is: Do lock-free data structures suffer from the scalability problem because? They often use atomic read, modify, write operations as part of their um, design, and the answer is they can do. They can suffer from that problem because uh, <coughs> if you have a um, you know, an atomic uh, a link list with atomic operations and it is frequently being updated, then that's going to be read, modify, write operations. Uh, the the benefit to the lock free ones is usually that if it's rarely updated, then there aren't any read modify writes, whereas if it's a mutex lock, then every mutex lock has to has to do the contention and the synchronization. Whereas the lock free ones, if it's rarely updated, then the um, processes can actually get copies across all their caches and they they don't have to have the have the synchronization all the time until you do an update. One of the benefits with the with the atomic operations that you have the uh, 
the load uh, compare store part so you can do a bunch of operation and be optimistic and then uh, like just check in the end that is my read is still valid so all what I did before is uh, is good and if you design your program in that way that you that you are most of the time in optimistic and some real cases you have to redo the whole thing you can really scale up the the, the system so you don't you don't end up in this situation. So yes. And and Mutex doesn't offer this uh, load modify store checks. So yes. So, so um, <coughs> and, uh, our, our friend here in the in the Commodore 64 T-shirt was was just saying that yes, one of the, the benefits of log free algorithms is that the the common pattern is that you do reads from your shared from your shared data structure, and then you can for, perform your local local operations. On the assumption that that's going to be okay, and then you do a final commit step, which is the, re the expensive read modify write. You see when you're modifying the data structure. So you're so you're um, only incur that cost at the at the end of the modification, and you you're not having to um, block. Every you know, if you're using a mutex, then you'd have to block every everybody for the whole duration of your operation. Whereas in this case. Then it's only that final read modified write that does the commit that then <coughs> incurs that synchronization cost, but it doesn't make the cost completely go away. No. So I know it, there is no. it is still a potential for lot free data structures to be a contention bottleneck and to provide scalability yeah. problems, but they are more potent they have more potential for scalability than mutex based ones do if designed correctly. Do we have any more questions? If yeah, you have something to add to any yeah. of the questions already given, yeah. then please do. Um, so I want to respond to first uh, to the question, um, can we pre-compute what we want to do on the different threads? Um, if you look at, um, well, you're, you're typically an, um, an application developer, right? Uh, programming in user land. Um, if you own the system, then you probably can do, so in the Commodore 64 uh, world, right, you probably own the system. Then you can do that, but the system is single threaded, so there is no advantage. Um, when you look at current systems today, right, servers, desktop workstations, notebooks, um, and you look at the number of processes running there, if you look at the number of uh, threads running, um, you can see numbers in the order of one and a half thousand, two and a half thousand running simultaneously, simultaneously, right? And your application uh, is done, um, let's go with a full core example here, right? You're signing up for workloads to run on four threads. Can you pre-compute what's going to happen and when those uh, tasks uh, uh, will be executed? No. Because there are so many other threads jumping in on the operating and scheduling that and the operating system um, is deciding when which thread is going to run and it de depends on the, on the timing, on the slices. There are many, many other things. Um, which influence that, and so you can never guarantee upfront um, when things are executing and coming back. Um, there was a second question on um, setup for um, different kind of thread, uh, threading models um, and how much time that takes. What you typically do uh, when you have uh, big workload and you want to multi-thread it, so you do this kind of setup up front. So what you're actually doing is you define up front, or let the system design, uh, de uh, define how many worker threads you want to have. Quite often it's, it equals uh, the number of uh, cores or number of hardware threads. And then you go for that. So you do that uh, at the beginning, during your initial, uh, initialization phase, and then you're done. 
and you have those um, worker threads waiting for you um, to go with any kind of work you're going to provide. There was a third question regarding uh, mutex versus uh, intrinsics. If you do it, um, if you disassemble what's happening actually in, in, in the mutex world is, well, mutex, uh, mutex uh, variables um, are more a convenience one, as provided by either operating system or the underlying right library. Uh, digging into, uh, doing hardcore, going down to the assembly, and you will find <coughs> the intrinsic operations down there. So it comes back to the intrinsic operations. If you can go, if you're really hardcore and uh, want to go for the um, for the last performance bit, uh, right? You will end up in intrinsics. Um, but think about if you really want that, and if you need that extra bit of performance. Okay. Any more question? Two, two more. Maybe. Okay. I'm, I'm go first. So, with all that being said, would you really recommend to try this at home? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, from just to, to do what? To do multi-threading? Yes. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Multi-threading that way, as it's being described here, and you can find in the literature, and the way doing multi-threading, which requires a very high level of expertise and understanding of the underlying system, would you kind of recommend, like, Go on and implementing hazard pointers or something like that on your own. Would you really, could you really recommend people that just do that? Implementing hazard pointers or implementing your own uh, multi-threading structure. Uh, if it's a hobby project and you don't have anything to do, why not? <laughs> um, but um, but not just for fun, right? Not yeah, just for fun, right? Yeah, but for a but what, yeah. What, what Anthony was was pointing at is. Um, yeah, how difficult it is, how, how difficult it is to guarantee uh, correct code. Um, and here I want to uh, turn back to one of my slides there, right? If you are in a professional environment and you have to guarantee, um, you might look for concepts already providing some service to you, like threading building blocks, for exactly. instance. That's what I want. Like, yeah or OpenMP concepts, uh, there are many more out. So what he is pointing at is, is actually um, at the hard path um, to go, right, which uh, requires lots of, lots of knowledge. Um, if you want to stay on the, on the application level more of, often, right, uh, try to take advantage of, um, of libraries there to use and then there, there are also design models right uh, with a graphical um, interface uh, where you can actually design and um, um, uh, throw different workloads uh, you might have um, to different worker threads and here you also need to um, to distinguish between data parallelism and task parallelism and all the things like that right and what you said is the uh, ace key is is the synchronization overhead you might have uh, between the different pieces there. There was another one, right? The, well, the, the, the second, uh, the second so question. I, you know. I would have um, appreciated if you get like um, have um, promoted usage of high level libraries like threading building blocks from Intel, right? Okay? <laughs> we can do next time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because this is really the safe way of I mean, maybe you won't get the last piece of performance out of the system, but it's kind of good. If you go, if you go TBB, for instance, right, with, um, as, a, as an example of a library, there's a free version, there's also an Intel maintained one uh, for you know, scalability even beyond and also supporting new processors. Um, we've seen uh, uh, one keyword here um, talking about spin loops, right? Um, I think I spent two two years on spin loops. Um, what you can do with them and how to optimize them and um, some of um, this research work is 
actually ending uh, or ended in, in some of the sewer processes where you can um, define upfront uh, for how long you want to spin or for how long you want to wait um, on the process. So this is quite dynamic. Um, this is extremely uh, tricky. There are some white papers, good white papers, uh, and they're probably blowing your mind if you read them. Um, but there are some, some key nuggets uh, in there if you want to write uh, synchronization objects. Um, you should uh, watch out uh, for those white papers uh, on spin loops and, and how to do them um, correct, if you really want to do that, right? Application developers try to go more high level. I was, I'm, I'm recommending that uh, to have really safe code. And there are different libraries. So you had the next question. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, you also mentioned a bit, uh, and one of the questions was um, how to avoid stalling the whole program because somebody is misbehaving. And especially if you write uh, web services or any kind of user input, that might be dangerous. Maybe uh, you know somebody just enters even in a GUI, like a huge mm -hmm. number, and then you um, happily distribute this thing and also work it right. And you have a limited amount, and there's a known problem that if you have a fixed threshold, that uh, if everybody's blocked, then the whole program is blocked. <coughs> so, um, how does preemption uh, in the user space come into play? Uh, or C++ parallel software? Is there maybe, uh, maybe what, what do you think of preempting the tasks that run, or, or maybe canceling tasks? Because if you have a uh, for loop which will never end because it, it, it's just working on endless, uh, endless loop, uh, your, your well, system will, will, will be uh, your, well, unavailable. So, yes, if you, if, <coughs> so the question is about um, if, if you've got a thread pool and you've got so, some, somehow you get a load of workers on there that are just going to sit there occupying your thread pool because they've got too much work to do. And I would say that generally that if you end up in that situation, that's because you're, as an application designer, you haven't thought about breaking up the problem enough. Um, because yes, you know, the overall behavior of your system can grind to a halt if your thread pool um, tasks get locked up. But if you're using a thread pool as a user, as a you know, developer, then who's using the thread pool, you need to be aware of, of, of that limitation and not just stick open-ended tasks on the, on the thread pool. Um, you need to have built in some, some mechanism for canceling the task, potentially, if, so that if the user clicks, no. <coughs> process, no, find me the 10 billionth um, prime number, and then they realise, actually, no, 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 I didn't mean that, I meant find me the 10th prime number. <laughs> then, then they can click cancel, and it, we, we'll actually cancel the background tasks. Um, and also, so, so that you can keep, keep the, you know, the application running and responsive. Um, sometimes that can mean that you have a thread pool that has um, some level of priority for tasks, so that you can have high priority tasks that really, really must happen, and low priority tasks which, well, if there aren't any high priority ones, then I can run those. Um, and so it, that's about it's about application design, and you know, there isn't you can't just you know, sadly in that particular sort of case you can't just download a third party library like Threading Building Blocks and say. It's okay. I'm using threading building blocks. It's all going to work fine because if you still you can still design your application that way. Um, and so, so yeah, that, that could be a there's, problem. There's, I'm sorry. There's the next uh, possibility. You're using some third-party code like the Zebra, mm -hmm. and it has a vulnerability if you yeah, say like minus one for the size of the uh, stream and so on. And then uh, you're you're not controlling this because you maybe it's part of the whole system already, uh, but then you will run into the problem. But so maybe there you should distribute the tasks into processes outside of your process. And that is a totally different uh, scalability uh, problem, because it's nearly like you were saying, between different machines and data systems. Yeah. 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 Ye
people. So, so the example here was that, that what, if, what if the code that has the problem is because you've got a third party library that you're relying on that has a particularly bad um, like behavior in some circumstance. You know, the example I think was Zlib, where if you, if you, if you set some, some parameter to minus one, then now the, the time, con time constraint blows up and it takes forever to do something. Um, that's just unfortunate. You, you can't, if you're using third party code, then sometimes it will have bugs. And sometimes those bugs will impact the behavior of your application. Um, and you can't, you can't avoid that. Um, yeah. so, so yes. Um, and just to go back to the point that, he, that the guy over there was making um, about sh should we use, um, no, should we, be, should we be designing these systems? And overall, you should not be trying to implement RCU and hazard pointers and concurrent data structures yourself. If you can get a, a library that implements them for you and using those, then using them in your application is one thing. Trying to implement them is really hard and either, you know, it, if it is your job to implement them, then fine. If it is your hobby to implement them, fine. But don't incidentally try and do it as part of developing some other application. <laughs> so, no, yes, use third party libraries that enable you to help do this sort of thing. Um, no, because that is their job, is making that library work, you know, and then it allows you to do your job of developing your application. Do we have more questions? So if you, sorry for taking over, if you really want to take um, take over and want to spend some time in multi-threading, right, um, don't waste your time in, in rebuilding objects which are already there. Um, most of the time, what uh, what we are seeing is uh, performance bottlenecks um, when it comes to memory management. Um, what people are quite often doing <coughs> is inside the thread, they're allocating memory, right? Um, that works for one, two, three, probably four threads. Um, if you really want to scale out to big systems, um, think about how memory management is done. You're going down to the kernel, and the kernel is single-threaded, and so you're, you're synchronizing uh, across all your ma your malloc operations. What you need on top um, to multi-thread your code is your own man memory manager. Um, there are some free ones. Some are coming with libraries for a reason. Um, spend your time on that doing them properly, right, and allocating the memory up front and then using it internally across the, the threads. That gives you the performance.